just in time for Christmas. The end of the war was... Lloyd George declared, let us build a home fit for heroes. The king expressed a wish that his people should now enjoy the peace which... There was a tremendous boom in trade, and before long the soldiers were back in boiler suits, back at the factory benches. The motto of the year was, back to normal. This comfortable feeling was undermined by a steep and sudden rise in prices. The pound dropped to half its pre-war value. Many soldiers were squeezed out of their old jobs and felt themselves betrayed. The unions were in an aggressive mood. They massed into bigger and bigger groups and amalgamations. They pressed for wage increases and the eight-hour day. They opposed the handing back of nationalized industries to their old employers. But the government decided to teach them a lesson. Inspired by the success of the Russian Revolution, left-wing agitators whipped up the atmosphere of discontent. Said Lloyd George, a feeling of passion and revolt reigned in the breast of the working class. The country was forced back into French warfare, but this time it was capital versus labor, officers versus men. Even the police went on strike because the government denied their right to form a union. The feeling of betrayal and pessimism was soon to be justified. By the end of 1920, Britain was overtaken by the terrible trade depression, which fell over the whole of Europe. By March 1921, the number of unemployed had risen to over one and a half million. The misery and squalor of the trenches had been almost unendurable. The humiliation of unemployment could be even worse. Some employers thought that a fairly high level of unemployment was extremely healthy. When men were fighting for jobs, they could be forced to accept lower wages. The guinea pigs of this harsh philosophy were the miners. The mining industry had been condemned as inefficient by two royal commissions, which the government has chosen to ignore. In March 1921, they surrendered wartime control of the industry and handed it back to its former owners, led by the Duke of Northumberland, a man who was described as totally lacking in human touch. His one concern was to keep profits steady. The only shortcut to profits was to reduce the wages bill. The owners had invited a strike. The government declared a state of emergency and general mobilization. Volunteers were signed up to keep the mines running. Soldiers were held in a state of readiness in case things got rough. In the mining towns, angry trade unionists prepared to fight to the finish, while their leaders hurried back and forth to London to argue with the employers and to try to force the government to intervene. Their main concern was to settle a national minimum wage instead of rates fixed district by district. But they were fighting a losing battle. All over the country, in every industry, wages were brutally cut and the union leaders were powerless. The unions had hoped to gain extra bargaining power through the new general council of the TUC, but the government was not in the mood to listen. By the end of 1925, a showdown looked inevitable. All the big unions passed resolutions in support of the miners, even if it meant a general strike. The TUC General Council, still hoping for a last-minute solution, didn't lay any definite plans. They did not see themselves as revolutionary, but the rank and file were bitterly determined. The miners' leaders left their headquarters convinced that the whole movement would stand behind them in the event of a strike. The miners' president, Herbert Smith, belonged to the old school of cloth cap, iron-fisted trade unionism. In negotiations, his favorite reply was, now doing. A.J. Cook, the general secretary, was a Welsh firebrand, a passionate orator. He coined the miners' slogans. 
Not a minute on the day, not a penny off the pay. One cabinet minister remarked, I thought the miners' leaders were the stupidest men in England until I met the owners. With coal production dropping steadily and the whole industry collapsing round their ears, they remain blind to any consideration but the need to cut wages in the interests of profit. The General Council, through its negotiating committee, did its best to find a middle way. So did the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, who was a mild and peaceable man. But he was under pressure from his cabinet. Some ministers tried, like him, to smooth things over. But another, a more powerful group, led by Winston Churchill, Chancellor of the Exchequer, was determined to force a fight. Negotiations collapsed, and at midnight, May the 3rd, 1926, the general strike began. On the first day, more than a million workers came out, in addition to the million mine workers involved in the lockout. Vast numbers of others waited impatiently in the second line of attack. That morning, with no public transport, city streets were snarled up by chaotic traffic jams. As for the strikers, the TUC reported a quiet, orderly and good-tempered desire to keep the peace. The government's appeal for volunteers was answered by thousands, mostly from the middle classes. Detachment of sea cadets were sent to work the mine without much success. At the docks, university undergraduates were ready and eager, but not particularly efficient. The railways were the most popular, quite a change from the office. After a day or two, the volunteers got some of the trains moving, but they were accident-prone and invariably late. The government had laid elaborate plans for the moving of essential food slots. Volunteers and troops were used, and parks were filled with milk churns. Often, the strike committees lent a hand. They didn't want anyone to starve. With all the regular newspapers shut down, one source of news was the government's official gazette, exuberantly edited by Mr. Churchill. Later, other papers put out small emergency editions, but most people relied on the BBC for news of the strike. Volunteer bus drivers were protected by the police, but usually encountered little more than jeering. One thing, though, that did arouse resentment was the use of troops and armoured cars to escort supplies to the docks. For the most part, the strikers offered little resistance, though there were one or two minor clashes with police in the east end of London. Some people thought that the swashbuckling activities of Mr. Churchill, always ready to bring in the troops and tanks, were a deliberate incitement to violence. In some cities, especially in the north, the strikers were more ferocious. In Doncaster, thousands of pickets, mostly miners, tried to block the roads. In Glasgow, violent crowds attacked the buses and sometimes succeeded in overturning them. In Newcastle, there were ugly scenes as strikers clashed with police on the town moor. Yet miraculously, no one was killed during the strike. One Labour politician ruefully remarked, the English are too sane for revolution. After a week of handing out strike pay, the union funds were running low. The leaders knew that they couldn't last out much longer and were looking for a way to reopen negotiations. The most anxious to end the strike was Jimmy Thomas, the railwoman's leader, who had a great respect for authority and was afraid the strikers might get out of hand. He called in a middleman. Sir Herbert Samuel, and without informing the miners, he and other members of the General Council decided that the strike must be called off, even though Baldwin refused to give any firm promise to meet their grievances. The strikers felt bewildered and betrayed. For two more days, they refused to go back to work. They didn't trust the government or their leaders. When they got back, many were victimized by the employers. The miners dug in for a fight to the finish. 
more obstinate and embittered than ever. Although they were almost starving and their families were living on charity, for six more months they fought their lonely battle. But the government gave way to the owners and the miners were forced back to work for longer hours and lower wages. They were utterly beaten. The coal crisis threw thousands more out of work. The labor exchanges were besieged by men looking desperately for employment. But as the depression dragged on, many resigned themselves to the possibility that they might never work again. The Communist Party gained in strength and organized angry demonstrations. Trade union membership fell by more than two million. But the TUC was lucky in its leaders. Ernest Bevin, boss of the transport workers, and Walter Citrine, the efficient general secretary, their dogged hard work saved the unions from collapse and disunity. The lean years following the strike brought another hard lesson. No miracle could be expected from a Labour government. In 1924 and 1929, Ramsay MacDonald was Prime Minister, but the Labour Party never had a clear majority, and his governments were brief and ineffectual. MacDonald himself had no time for what he called the whirlpool of class-conscious trade unionists. During his first government, he saw the TUC General Secretary once for five minutes. His desertion of his own party in 1931 to form a national government with Baldwin was a bitter blow for Labour. No government could do anything to restore life and vitality to the depressed industrial towns. Bevin and other trade union leaders suggested ambitious schemes for public works, but the politicians ignored them. Their alternative was a humiliating system of public charity, the dole, and free soup for the children. From the hungry towns of the north, Hartlepool, Newcastle, Jarrow, Glasgow, ragged armies of unemployed plodded along the road to London. Hunger marches disturbed the public conscience and annoyed the politicians, but they could only be an outlet for despair. The trade unions sympathized, but did not take part. Gradually, during 1935 and 36, the black cloud of depression began to lift a little, and the number of unemployed dropped slowly but surely. At last, the government made an assault on the slums. In the large cities, thousands of families were moved from squalid back-to-backs and rehoused in new council flats. There was more time and money to spend on pleasure and a week's paid holiday a year. Industry came to life again, and the newer industries, such as the mass production of cars, began at last to prosper. By 1939, the growing danger of war with Germany brought the need to rearm. On September the 3rd, war was declared. While the rest of Europe suffered the horrors of invasion and occupation by the Germans, British cities were devastated by heavy bombing. The entire civilian population was involved in this total war. Old class and party divisions were set aside. The Labour Party joined Churchill's coalition government. Bevan was made Minister of Labour with unprecedented power over the lives of civilians. Churchill recognized the importance of the trade unions in wartime, but he himself was not interested in domestic matters. While he finished the main task, the winning of the war, his labor colleagues worked out their plans for nationalized industries and the welfare state. Relations between the unions and the Labour Party under Mr. Astley were more friendly and constructive than they had ever been. When the war ended in May of 1945, there was a feeling that the old world of the 1920s and 30s, with its rigid class barriers, was dead forever. The general election in July 45 aroused great excitement and polling was exceptionally heavy. 
The heavy poll favoured the Labour Party, which won the election by a huge majority. This was the climax of the long struggle. The election had been won on policies which were the result of intensive planning and cooperation between the party and the unions. Six trade unionists were included in Attlee's cabinet and Bevin became foreign secretary. Since then, whatever party has been in power, the importance of the trade unions in the political and economic life of the nation has steadily increased. Their power and importance is recognized by industrialists and politicians alike. Neither would dare, even if they wanted to, either ignore or destroy them. On the highest level, they are brought into the councils of state. Indeed, it is sometimes said that the unions prefer a conservative government to a labor one, because it is more embarrassing to bargain with their own party especially about wages. The modern trade union leader is usually a harassed, overburdened man who works longer hours for less money than most of his members. He has to play the difficult role of go-between for the government, the employers and the members of his union. He is the committee man. Yet cloth cap oratory is not quite dead. Sometimes old class war battle cries echo through the conference hall though they no longer arouse much enthusiasm. Millions of rank-and-file members have lost interest in union affairs and attendance at branch meetings is invariably small. This leaves the way open for discontent and agitators. The communists have been quick to take advantage and to stir up unofficial wildcat strikes. This has given the unions a bad image and a hostile press. Their achievements have been solid and impressive. Most of their original objectives have been won. The leadership now faces a tremendous challenge to bring the movement up to date and to win back the enthusiasm of the ordinary card-carrying members on whom their power rests.